And I'm uh, I'm Wesley Workman. I uh, I work at a startup downtown uh, called Battery, and we use uh, Ember a lot, um, and we use Broccoli as our build tool. Uh, so this morning when I got up and I checked the meetup, I saw there were 10 people, and I thought, okay, maybe eight will show up, and now I've got a packed house. So that's great and nerve-wracking at the same time. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, you ready to roll, Kevin? I'm totally ready. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Broccoli build tool. Um, I chose this meetup uh, to talk about Broccoli because... Broccoli is mainly a Node-based uh, build tool that's really back-end agnostic. Um, so being JavaScript Meetup, I thought that you guys would get a kick out of that. And also, you know, it's got a lot of web stuff to it. Um, it's still beta. Um, it, it's been out for about a year. Um, all of the plugins and all of Broccoli itself is um, O.x. So there's still a lot of turn. Um, I haven't really been burnt by a whole lot of changes yet. Um, so that said, I wouldn't discourage use, but you know, be warned that it is beta software. Um, so what is Broccoli? Uh, in their words, Broccoli is a fast, reliable asset pipeline supporting constant time rebuilds and compact build definitions. Comparable to Rails asset pipeline in scope, though it runs on Node and is backend agnostic. Um, I would just call it a simple and fast build tool. Um, it's very, very simple. The whole component of Broccoli itself is maybe about 500 lines of code. Um, so it's very, very simple to understand, um, and it's very fast. Uh, what isn't Broccoli? So Broccoli isn't a task runner like Grunt. Um, I've not used a lot of Grunt. Um, I might make a couple of comparisons, and if I see something wrong about Grunt, please let me know. Um, but Grunt itself is a task runner. That was what it was founded for. And people added watchers on top of it and things like that to make it um, a build tool as well. But the general vision for Broccoli is that Broccoli and Grunt will actually coexist together, Grunt as the task runner, Broccoli as the asset pipeline mechanism. Um, so just to clarify that uh, point. And uh, the people responsible, um, I just chose these two people to pick. There's a lot of open source out there. Um, these people are the owners of the main repositories and the GitHub organization. Um, Joe Liss, she's the founder um, of Broccoli. She's been working on it for about a year. Um, and Robert Jackson is a Ember Core guy who has been volunteering a lot of his time to help get the Broccoli plugins in shape. Um, so who's using it? I'm using it. That's me, if you can't tell. Um, we're using it at Battery for our build tools. Um, the Ember CLI project is essentially a conventional um, Broccoli project. So it's meant to, if you're using Ember and you wanted to use a build tool, it's a set of conventions um, that use Broccoli underneath um, as a runner suite, if that makes sense. Um, so I went back and forth if I wanted to do code first or if I wanted to dive into Broccoli first. And I felt that it was easier to, to understand the code later if you knew a little bit up front about the anatomy of broccoli. Um, so please bear with me. I promise you'll see code. Um, there are three primary components um, to broccoli. There are trees, which are essentially chainable plugins. Those are your workhorses. They do everything uh, from structuring your project, and you'll see more of that later. Um, you've got a watcher. The watcher is in charge of um, just figuring out when things have changed, and your builder, which is in charge of building. Um, it also comes with a CLI and a server, but I kind of think of that as a secondary component. Uh, and I'll explain why at the end. Um, so this is a slide from one of Joe Liss's uh, talks that I thought was pretty good. Um, so I was going to use that. Um, a broccoli tree is basically responsible for mapping things on your file system to virtual trees that you can use as part of chainable plugins. Um, it doesn't deal with files individually. It deals with globs. So the motto is trees, not files. So you're not individually specifying files. You're specifying globs and patterns, whether it's all the JavaScript files in this directory or all the styles in this directory, um, rather than working on individual files. Um, each of these plugins is chainable. Um, the plugins themselves all do a certain type of operation, uh, data in, data out. The plugins are completely agnostic of each other. They don't have to know anything about each other. Um, from what I understand, that's one of the criticisms of the Grunt Watcher. Again, I've never really used it. Um, but in the blog post that I see, people talk about how the Grunt Watchers plugins have to have knowledge of each other in some cases to properly handle um, mutation of data or uh, translation of data. And Broccoli's trees themselves are completely agnostic of each other. Um, it's just data in, data out. So in this example here, the, each of these green things represents a folder on the file system, and each of these white things represents a virtual tree or um, a plugin aspect. And the, the first step of this tree is that we take the CoffeeScript files from the lib directory and we run it through a lib compiler. 
and that out that returns another plugin or another tree and that'll make more sense when you see the code but the the general concept is that at each phase you're either mutating data or you're combining data so we've got the coffee script we've compiled the coffee script into javascript we take our vendor javascript files and merge those together into an app.js file we take our styles and we compile those with sass or less or you don't have to compile them at all you can concatenate them um, into an app css and then you might take any public files and you would merge all of those together and so that's essentially a map or a, a tree structure that represents the beginning of your file system and the output of your build um, and each of these phases don't have to know about each other they just have to know what to do with the input and how to render output um, let's see so these are all plugins that exist currently and there are a lot more these are all official broccoli plugins um, to do lots of different things um, I should have made some popular ones bold, but I mean anything from sort of manipulating directory structures um, to compiling CSS um, to importing stuff from Bower um, to doing asset compilation and fingerprinting. Um, all of these plugins are really what make Broccoli possible. The core of Broccoli itself is just agnostic of any sort of operation, whether it's compiling JavaScript or any of that stuff. Um, so the Watcher. So the watcher is pretty simple. Um, it just watches for changes in directory. The default broccoli watcher um, pulls any of the directories that you saw in that previous guide. Oops. Um, it pulls any of those directories for changes recursively. Um, obviously, polling is slow. So there's a broccoli sane watcher that uses um, sane as a file system monitor tool that um, adds callbacks so that um, you can substitute that in as a different package so that your file system will tell Broccoli when to rebuild instead of having a poll guy sitting. Um, but the watcher, that's his only job, is to know what the source elements are from the project and when to kick off a new build. Um, the build trig triggered by the watcher. Um, it doesn't do any partial rebuilding. Every build is a full rebuild of the app. Um, processes the tree from the bottom up, starting at all the leaf nodes, working its way inward. Um, there's no parallelism to it. Um, it relies completely on promises internally. Um, so one example of a promise internally would be it might um, call out to SAS and let SAS do the comp compilation. SAS calls back and it continues to the next node in the tree. Um, so each plugin has a set of promises uh, that it will fulfill. So talking about speed, that all sounds really slow. Um, <coughs> and the reason they don't do partial rebuilds is because they're kind of hairy. Um, and I think that... From what I read, again, I don't know much about Grunt, but from what I read that got some of the Grunt guys into a lot of trouble trying to do partial rebuilds um, because it requires um, multiple plugins to have an understanding of the other plugins and know how to trace an output file back to an input file so that when an input JavaScript file changes, the tree itself has to know how that input file travels through the tree in order to properly do the partial rebuild. Um, and so it requires each of the plugins to take on a little bit more knowledge. And so doing a full rebuild makes the code simpler. Um, but it has to be fast. It can't take six seconds to change a JavaScript file, uh, to rebuild after a JavaScript file changed. So the solution is plugin caching. Each of those nodes that you saw, I think I have it here. Yeah. Each of these nodes, everything in white is a plugin. And it's responsible for caching its input and output. So there are plenty of tools in Broccoli uh, to help you watch directories to see if they're changed and to cache the input with stamps and things like that. So the idea is that if I don't change anything in lib, lib compiled should be able to just serve up the last cache that it served up. And the same thing goes for the JavaScripts. So like in this example here, if I change something in styles, the whole tree is going to rebuild. And the builder <coughs> is going to ask the lib compiled plugin to build its stuff. It can know by using internal cache stamps that that code hasn't changed. So it can serve up the old files. And same with this JavaScript merger, he can do the same thing. And same with the apps.js, it can do the same thing. So the goal is to have only the things impacted be rebuilding on the way down. And everything else is using its internal cache. Does that all make sense? Is that automatic? That's a good question. So if you're writing a plugin, each plugin is responsible for caching input and output. Um, there are a couple of prototype helpers um, for caching, um, the one that's commonly used, for, it's a lot easier for one-to-one, -one, right? Like um, CoffeeScript is a great example. You compile one file, you get one in, one out, two in, two out, three in, three out. And so they have a prototype helper that will 
stamp your input files and let you know if your output files are the same or not. And they're fast stamping. The broccoli caching writer is still in flux, but it's meant to do multi-in, one out. So like SAS is an example, knowing if stamping all of your SAS files and knowing if a SAS file changed, letting you recompile SAS, if not letting you serve the last compiled version you got from that plugin. Does that make sense? Sounds like the save that effect as partial builds to me, though. Am I missing something? Um, I, I think that the net out is that each plugin is responsible for their own caching, and the whole system would rebuild. So, like this JavaScript merger right here, um, if he didn't implement some mechanism for caching, he would rebuild. Um, so, it's, it's, okay. it's similar, right? But it's the, the, the different responsibility. Okay. Yeah, the net outcome is absolutely the same, okay. but it's the, the implementation is different. Um, It uh, depends upon what the operation is. Um, like JS hint is an example. That's a one in, one out. So um, JS hint is smart enough to know, or that base um, broccoli filter um, is smart enough to know that I just changed that one JavaScript file. I just need to run JS hint on that one file. So it's up to the component whether it exactly. builds with internal to it. Exactly. Um, but in the case of SAS, because SAS um, is a little different it, in the way it imports things, if you change any one SAS file, you're going to have to rebuild the whole output file. Uh, but that's up to the individual components to decide that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so is there any questions on any of that tree stuff before I move on? I think it, now that you have some background on it, the code might make more sense when I show it. But So this might be a completely obvious question, but so the, the end result is a single file that includes CSS and JavaScript? No, the end result is a directory that contains any number of files structured in any number of ways. So if you think of it like as an input, the absolute most input is your project directory, and it might have a bunch of JavaScript and a bunch of CSS and a bunch of images scattered throughout. The output is a build directory, which is got your JavaScript maybe concatenated and maybe you got the images rearranged. So the goal is to get from the beginning of the project, which is how it is in your revision control system, to the output, which is how it is when you deploy it on the server. And each of these things would help you mutate um, your project along the way, whether it's compiling um, SAS, or whether it's concatenating, or whether it's just moving files to a different folder. Anything else? Cool. Um, so the last thing is the CLI and the server. Um, the server itself is built um, with Express. This is the development server. Obviously, they don't have a production server. Um, it's built with Express and Connect. Um, it just uses <coughs> middleware pattern. Um, there's a broccoli middleware that's responsible for um, hooking up the builder and some other things for Broccoli side. Um, the default server uses the tiny LR, which is a tiny live reload server, which I'll show. Um, and most people don't end up using Broccoli server um, out of the box. It's only about 40 lines of code. It's very minimalistic. Most people end up implementing their own server that uses Broccoli middleware. So they can do things like um, using proxy middleware to proxy requests um, to a back end or any kind of other servicing they want to do to simulate their uh, production server. And the CLI, um, he starts the server and just does production builds. So both the CLI and the server are maybe 100 lines of code. Um, so most people that are using Broccoli on a large scale just implement their own. Does that make sense? Yes, no? OK. Sure. It, it does, but it also has a live server um, so that you can, as you edit, you can have um, your browser attached to it. Live yeah, li Just for live reload? Well, live reload in a development server, right? Like if your back end um, is agnostic, or it's, it's meant to be back end agnostic so that you might not have your back end serving your assets in development mode. Um, so the Broccoli server might serve your assets in development mode. And then your back end might be running locally or it might be running someplace else. Um, and you use a proxy server to connect to your back end. Oh, okay. It's like an asset server. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, exactly. It's meant to be agnostic of um, running in with any back end server. Um, so this is something I've been doing lately. Uh, when I ever I give a demo, um, I try to throw in what sucks about the tool chain because no tool chain is perfect. Um, I think that the worst thing about uh, Broccoli so far was 
it's hard to debug your trees a little bit. Um, when you define a tree, you're not really processing the tree at the same time. You're defining a tree that gets processed later when there's a file that's changed. So using no debugger oftentimes involves putting breakpoints in a lot of promise code that's um, constantly being called back as each node processes. So it, it can be a little hard to debug your tree um, while you're getting going. But once you get it figured out, it, it's not too bad. It's easy to look at. Um, and also, there's not a lot of good tutorials out there yet. There's not a lot of good support articles. Um, it's still rather new. So that, that's another downside, I think. Um, OK, so I'm going to show a demo. Um, you would have thought I've learned enough times to uh, not do live demos, but we're going to try it out. Um. So, just real quick, is Broccoli running on top of Grunt or no? No. It's not, but it has, still has to have Node.js installed, right? Exactly. Okay. Yep, yep. So right now, I just started the server. This just starts up a local Express server. Um, and it uses Broccoli's middleware um, as part of the mechanism to handle the building and serving. Um, so that's the, the basic part. So in your Brock file, um, the Brock file itself is a conventional file that would be in every broccoli directory. Um, at the end of the Brock file, it should export a tree. Now, in this case here, we're exporting app slash public. Um, strings are considered as trees also. If broccoli finds a string, it'll just do an import and treat that as a tree. Um, so at the root of every chainable plugin, you have a string someplace um, where you're specifying uh, where the files come from originally. Um, so in this case here, I can return a string. And this is going to cause Broccoli to just serve up app public. Um, and I'm going to use the term serve up, but the serving and the building really are the same thing. Um, you do a production build, and it dumps assets out. Um, if you're doing development, it just serves them up from the server. Um, but they're in the same format. Um, so the first thing you would see like I said, is, is this guy here. Um, oh, great. I'm just going to run heat in this, but. I need the live reload plugin. So I will just run over here. So there's a live. Does anyone use tiny live reload? Um, tiny live reload, just a tiny live reload server. Um, you can send a message out uh, on a port, and there's a plugin that allows you to uh, accept that message, and it just refreshes the page. So that as you're editing code, you click Save, and it can refresh the page for you. Um, it's just kind of handy. So in this example here, um, I'm importing everything that's in app.public, which is just an index file, as my tree. Um, you can see that here. I don't know if I can bump this up. Any Sublime users here? I don't think I can bump this guy up. Sorry. Um, so the first step to do is I have, sorry, I have this cheat sheet over here of all the stuff I built. Um, OK. So the first step to do is to bring in some JavaScript. Um, so that I'm right now when I input actually let me do a build that might make more sense. Sure. Oh okay. I mean just so we can make it bigger so we can see like the end of the Oh oh I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. You probably fixed them a little bit. Those are just word right. Imports. Okay. Um, so let me do a broccoli build. Quick broccoli build. Maybe this will make, help make sense. So I chose to build um, broccoli. And so it loads this broccoli file. Um, it takes the tree and applies all the inputs that are defined in that tree and builds an output. And in this case, I've just specified app public. And that's my output tree. And so in the disk you'll see right here, the only thing it did was it copied the assets from public into here. Um, if I made this slash app and I reran it, you would see that the disk now contains everything that was in the apps directory. Um, so this is the most basic tree you can have as an input output. It just maps one to one. Um, so the first thing we'll do is we'll throw a chainable plugin in there 
uh, to help convert some stuff. Um, so I will grab, there is a Bower plugin. Um, find Bower trees. And the Bower plugin, let's see, concat. The Bower plugin knows how to look at your Bower JSON file, and it knows how to go through and find all of your dependencies and build trees for each of those guys. Um, and what it returns is a list of trees. Um, so in this case, the only thing I have in Bower is just jQuery. Um, so it should build a Bower tree that imports jQuery. Um, I say input files is everything. Oops. JavaScript and output files is um, assets vendor.js. And this would return a tree for me. Let's see if our, um, we'll call this the vendor tree. And if you remember that diagram that I showed, um, this guy here is a, this concat is a plugin. And he would be one of those white objects on the tree that's connecting um, different sources. So this guy here, actually, I'm sorry. Bower trees. The, the Bower trees plugin um, happens to return an array of trees and not just one tree. Um, it gives you a tree for each of your Bower dependencies. So I'm just going to merge those trees together. Um, so that it's one tree. And then I'm going to use the concat tool. He's going to find all the JavaScript files in those trees and output them to vendor.js. And I might have missed this, but what's your definition of a Bower tree? Um, the Bower tree is just, uh, so a tree itself is just a set of files for an individual, whatever you want to think of it as, as a component. Um, Bower trees are. Um, a tree for each Bower package you import. So in this case, I've just imported jQuery. Um, but if I had imported like Ember or Angular and a bunch of other things like um, QUnit, it would build me a tree for each of my dependencies um, that I've defined in Bower so that I could merge those together. So a Bower package is just a, a dependence library basically? Yeah. Yep. Yep. I got a quick question. Sure. So in this case, you're, you're I guess, concatenating all this stuff into Vendor. I mean, realistically, though, aren't there many JavaScript files in there that you don't want to include? Um, that that, that's an excellent question. Um, the, uh, the Bower trees is smart enough to look at the main for each Bower. So it walks through the Bower definition and then walks through those files and then finds the main definitions. So as long as definitions. the Bower component has a main defined. Exactly. Okay. That's, a, that's a great question, though. Otherwise, you're right. It would import all the JavaScript files it found. So if you're doing your production build, does it know that to use the distribution packages instead of the main packages? That's a great question. Um, Bower, the Bower trees guy, I'm not sure if he does or not. Um, but when you're defining your trees, you could set that up yourself. Um, but that's a, that's a good question. I don't know if this is a plugin. Uh, this is a plugin. I don't know if that plugin honors um, production builds or not. Um, so vendor trees. So I will just return this vendor tree here. And I will rebuild that server. And of course the build failed because it's a live demo. Vendor tree. That's why I made a cheat sheet. Put. That should totally work. Of course, input file, input files. Thank you. So in this dist, um, you would see assets, and you would see vendor. So this is essentially that tree. Um, the only tree that I've exported right now is this vendor tree. And inside of my assets vendor, which comes from this assets vendor, would be jQuery concatenated um, with any other potential plugins. So that's how I've defined that. So the next thing to do is to bring back in the index file. Um, because I need an index file. So merge trees, app, public,
So again, in this disk, you can see it brought in um, the vendor tree that we originally had here, and it also brought in the public tree, and it merged those two together. Um, so is that, is that starting to make sense a little bit about how those trees can be created in separate and then funneled down to each other? Yes, no, a little bit? A little bit, okay. Uh, so the next step is to, we'll use the server. Actually, the next step would be to bring in some JavaScript. So I, I sure. Um, so the, the no modules, like you have all those broccoli libraries defined in where? Where is that file? Um, that's in my package JSON, yeah. Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, so I just defined these as upfront dependencies that I knew I would need for the demo. Um, so these are just a bunch of plugins. Each plugin itself, so I have Broccoli itself, which is the core of Broccoli, and then each of these is a separate plugin that's stored in a separate repository. And each plugin, again, becomes a node on your tree. Um, it's funneling data in and putting data out. So if I delete that directory uh, node modules, I can do an MP, what is it? NPM install. Yeah, NPM install. It'll go here and grab all this, right? Yep, absolutely. Yep. Um, so the next step is to build some uh, to build an app tree for my app JavaScript files. Um, so I'm going to do app tree. Concat, concat obviously is one that takes multiple files in, renders one file out. Um, and in this case, I know that. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, that should work. Um, Again, at, you can use strings as trees. So in this case here, this is a tr treated as a tree just as this is treated as a tree. Um, and I'll put input files will be anything that is a JavaScript file. Uh, again, located within this tree, which is anything under applications. And the output file will be assets app.js. And lastly, I will uh, put that app tree in here. So now it's going to merge those three trees together. And instead of doing a build this time, I will uh, run a server so you can see what it looks like. Um, so those are build times, by the way. So it took uh, 71 milliseconds uh, to rebuild that tree. And OK, so the library loader is on. Let me blow this up. Um, you see, you got the hello world and hello JavaScript. The hello world comes from the index definition right here. And the hello JavaScript comes from a JavaScript definition that happens to be over here. Um, so right now what's happening is it's importing all of my JavaScript through this tree, writing it out to assets.app. And as it combines these trees, that app.js becomes available for the um, for the final build to use. Does that all make sense? Yeah, kind of, a little bit? OK. Um, so the next thing we can show is CoffeeScript. Um, so we've got a couple of CoffeeScript files in our uh, package also. And I'm not sure how elegant that CoffeeScript was. I copied and pasted it earlier. I'm not a CoffeeScript guy. But um, <coughs> there is a plugin for filtering CoffeeScript. And um, all you do, basically, is you uh, see, make that part of my tree. And then I'm going to substitute this. And hopefully, this will work. And if it does, I'll explain it. If not, we'll debug it. Perfect. So what's happening here is, again, app is the source tree. It's looking at everything under my apps directory here. And the first step is this filter CoffeeScript plugin goes through and he finds any CoffeeScript files. And then he compiles those down to JavaScript files. So this tree here results in everything you see here except for the CoffeeScript files compiled to JavaScript files. If you were to imagine as that tree diagram. The next step is to take all of those JavaScript files, including the compiled CoffeeScript files, and funnel those down into a single apps.js file. And so the output of this file basically looks like that. Let's see if I can bump that up. Too much. So I have some commented out JavaScript. Um, but yeah, essentially, he takes um, both of these files, 
and funnels them in one. And actually, there is another option for eval. I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact option argument, but it is wrap and eval. So wrap and eval um, appends the name so that Chrome will uh, reestablish those. They're not called. I think they're called source maps technically, but they're not really a source map. But um, No domain, that's what I want. Um, so because I use the evals setting, um, all of that code you just saw a minute ago is wrapped in an eval so that Chrome can later make sense of it and he can show those original files. Um, so this is essentially the same file virtualized that I had on my file system. It's been funneled down to apps.js, and then using source maps, it, it gets it back for debugging. Um, Um, the source maps is a tricky thing. Um, they're still working on it because each plugin is responsible for generating its own source maps. And so really, well, it's not necessarily you merge a tree of source maps, but if I had true source maps for CoffeeScript, um, this compilation step here would both compile the JavaScript and output source, source maps, exactly. Um, and it doesn't do that now. So it's up to each individual guy, like SAS would have to provide his own source maps because those are the only guys that can actually make sense of the original code. Um, so the next thing is to show um, bringing in SAS. So I'm going to got some predefined uh, SAS files up front, and I am just going to use the SAS compiler and build a quick SAS tree. So I'll call it styles tree. And the first argument is the uh, the tree itself, which is styles. And if you're familiar at all with um, SAS, you know you need a, a main file basically so that it can get the load order right. Um, so I call mine main.scss so I could remember. And an output file. So I will output to assets.app, oops, app CSS, CSS. And then I will include that styles tree as my final merged. Save it. And every time you change your Brock file, you do have to restart your Broccoli server. Um, that's just because the Broccoli definition has been cached from the first run. But when you're changing regular JavaScript or HTML or files, you don't have to, of course. Oh. The first argument is an array, of course. So reloading. And so it, um, the color is blue. The, the blue color came from, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, the blue color comes from uh, this mixin here. Uh, just applies color blue. Um, I just used that mixin to demonstrate the fact that it was actually compiling SAS. Um, so it starts off a little rough, but w once you start to, to get the fact that it's about a tree um, that applies from your input, to your output, I think Broccoli starts to make a lot more sense. Um, so that's just another example. Each of these are just all plugins. And the plugins themselves can be written by anybody or can be contained anywhere. Um, Broccoli has a lot of official ones um, that I've mainly used. But Do you use the Aglify plugin for Broccoli? Yes. Yep. Do you have an example of that? Sure. I'd be happy to. Um, they also do, there's also a plugin for asset fingerprinting. But um, let me uh, <coughs> Broccoli. That's one thing I've learned in this uh, presentation that I cannot spell broccoli. Every time. So let's put it in the package.json. Oh, I totally do have it. Sweet. Update that version. PM update real quick. And Uglify just takes a tree in and options out. The options are mangle, compress, output. Great. Um, so I'll take the app tree. Um, presumably is what we want to uh, modify, minify all the JavaScript inside that. Uh, just import it.
we'll say mangle true. So I believe that should just work um, because it's already been it's already been concatenated together. Um, so the uglify guy, when he is running, all he'll really read is the fact that there's an app.js file. Um, he won't have to read the fact that there are other files. They've already been concatenated together. So is he then modifying the app? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Each one, each of those um, plugin operations creates their, takes the set of the output from their previous one, modifies, modifies it, and returns it as their output. Um, and internally, they can keep cache stamps so that they don't have to recompute every time there's a rebuild. Let's see. NPM. I'm going to do a build this time so we can see that broccoli build. Of course. And I probably have to remove that. Of course. Yeah, let me turn off the eval. The eval mode um, can be set here uh, for the concatenation, um, wrapping things in eval. Typically, you do that for development, and you don't do it for um, production. It just lets Chrome understand it a little better. Okay, so in this case, yeah, it did minify uh, the code as much as possible. I don't really have any variables. There's a variable there. So I have a last question with this one. Sure. Uh, is there a map, like is there a setting, is there an input where you can create a map with the, after it gets minified? That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure if this plugin supports source map. Source maps are not yet to be supported. Um, uh, I guess my other question is, have you used Uglify in your coding with them? Like, you use Ember, right? Yeah, have yep. You with that? Yeah. Was there no issues? Like, the, the native libraries in Ember, you didn't have to use, you had to use dependency injection and stuff like that, right? Or yeah, so with Ember, um, we did, um, we have a little bit more of a complicated tree for our uh, vendor packages, um, and we import for production time, we import Ember's pre-modified one, uh, pre-minified one. Um, so we just ran that through Uglify once more um, after everything was concatenated together. Okay. So, well, I guess what I'm saying is I, I work with Angular and I, I do an Uglify, Uglify with Grunt and I have a lot of issues. I have to make sure I do uh, dependency injection for all my controllers. I'm just wondering if this will work. Like, do you know if it'll work? Do you think it'll work with this? I don't know. Somebody would have to write a broccoli ng min. So you can you can either not mangle your variables because it's a variable mangling. Oh, okay, that's what it is. Gotcha. Or, or you can yeah. yeah, I chose to mangle. You could use compress instead. Um, yeah, with with Ember, all the dependency injection is by name, so it doesn't string name, so it doesn't worry about minification. Like it doesn't it doesn't rely on variable names. It relies on but string names. But yeah. yeah, so in this case. Yeah. So, oops. So in this case, it just I just compressed. I didn't mangle. Um, but yeah, that's essentially up to each pl plugin to implement something like that. Sure. So one of my frustrations with build tools like Grunt is it, it seemed like there was no standard API for plugins. It was like you know the SAS plugin would take input file, uh, output file, but the last plugin would take some random like other different API. Is there some standard? Uh, you mean in terms of the actual files, or do you mean in terms I mean, like of like I the? See here, like your one of these takes an input file, an output file. Yep. Like another Uglify just takes a tree. Okay. Or okay. Thing. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. That each plugin just sort of implements their own. Um, there is generally convention around like in, being called input files, being called output files. The first argument is usually your source tree, okay. um, and it usually it always has to return um, a result tree. Um, but in terms of the options, yeah. I mean each. Each guy has its own yeah, options. Some, some have options, but I just, that was just very frustrating seeing them. Just having to learn a new API every time. Like, yeah. Could, could you kind of show me how you, how you had a setup for environment specific builds? Like, sure, like, absolutely. Um, this is not this one's not set up here, but I um, could absolutely easily show you that um, an example of that. So let me um, actually let me look at my code over here real quick. Grab that. Um, so, 
broccoli um, environment variable um, will put uh, development or um, I believe it's production prod. Um, and so what I would normally do in this case for like if I didn't want to uglify for dev but I wanted to uglify for production is I would just do something like this. And pray that that works. Um, because in this case here, if it's a production build, I'm essentially just n chaining in an extra element on the tree. And that extra element is uglify. So again, if you flash back to that diagram that I had, actually, I'll just pull it up. Um, this guy here. So like in, in my um, production build, I might add an extra guy right here that is to, because they're all chainable, I might conditionally chain in the uglifier. I might conditionally chain in asset fingerprinting or something like that. Um, and in this case here, I'm essentially doing the same thing. So let's see if it works. Um, so at production time, which is what broccoli build should be, it should pass um, production as the environment variable there. It should do, yeah, see the key with live demos is to use the word should. Um, let me see what I did over here. Let's see, production. It should totally be production. That's exactly what I'm doing. This is my, my project uh, that I've used it for, environment equals production. Uh, maybe, actually, maybe Broccoli wants me to pass that in. Actually, I know where I can look. I'm sorry. Um, build, yeah, Broccoli EMV production, of course. I swear I thought that that was uh, automatically done by Broccoli, but I guess that kind of makes sense. So in this case here, uh, this should work, yeah. So when I do a production build, um, it's just in my broccoli definition, it's checking for the production environment variable, and it's choosing to chain or not chain in that plugin. So that, that you know, when you're, getting, you're grabbing that out of your package, is that what's that, like how are you getting the uh, process.env.broccoli? Uh, that's, that's part of the node process, I believe. Process is part of node, yeah? Yep. Okay, cool. Okay. Okay, so the broccoli environment, that's your that's yeah. I'm setting that right here. When I when I do this build. So not doing that would just result in a development build, basically, which is non-concatenated stuff. Or non yeah, non uh, minified. Can you, sure. Can you like walk through like like real, like how do you use this in real life? Like sorry, sure. Flow, right? Because you've got like for say like for example like Rails and Ember, so you'll have a broccoli server watching your. File yep. And then creates this, but you still got a link. Sure, <laughs> absolutely. To, to it somehow. Yeah, absolutely. So there are two cases, production and development. In the case of production, or I'm sorry, in the case of development, um, you would have uh, a local server running, and you would probably use Broccoli middleware um, to point to your development server so that they're probably on different ports, but um, the Broccoli files, whatever they are, if they're Ember or whatever, are essentially s communicating with the Broccoli server as if they were normal. And everything gets proxy. Everything that Broccoli doesn't find as a servable asset would get proxied through to your development server, and your development server would you know respond with whatever JSON or or whatever your choice is, and um, proxy that back up to the app. Um, so in the case of uh, production, you would just um, use some sort of task tool to copy the assets out of dist into your final resting place, um, whether it's Ant or Grunt or anything. Okay, and you just link to it and then just ship it. Back. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, is that, so the middleware thing, is that the new way to do things these days? <laughs> I haven't worked like this in a while. And before I would just, um, what I've done in the past is do like Grunt Watch to do that disk, but then my development file has like a, just a, like a sure. script tag that points to it. Sure. Maybe there's an if statement or something. That's sure. I think so because um, before uh, Ember CLI came along, um, a lot of people were using Ember AppKit, and before that, they were using Asset Pipeline, which were like backend aware tool chains. So they worked with Rails, but they didn't work with backends that didn't have any support. Um, so the goal of this project is to build a front end build tool system that can work for any backend. And the backend doesn't necessarily need to know how to build those packages. So, like, if you were using Python or Node or um, Go or anything, that doesn't have a wide community support set to build in um, all of those 
tool chains for the back end use this um, use this front end build tool front end server that would simulate um, live serving and then proxy things through. Does that kind of make sense? Sorry, I fumbled that a little bit. Well, sort of. So like with the middleware, has, where's the middleware live? I thought that would live on, in your app on the server in some route. So the proxy middleware, um, let, me, let me plug that in and show that. Um, so let's see. Uh, the broccoli, doesn't, broccoli itself doesn't ship with a proxy middleware, um, but most people that use broccoli, 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 um, We'll use it. So this is just a standard node file, um, standard express um, definition, excuse me. And in this case here, you see I'm just building an app. If you're familiar with node, this is how you construct an express server. Um, you would just, basically, you would implement this code in your own project, and you would add in a proxy um, proxy server. And yeah, so in your, like if you have a node app, you put this in there. Yeah. To, to proxy well, static. Yeah, you put it in Broccoli, and you let Broccoli proxy your requests to your Node app. Um, oh, Broccoli. Broccoli is proxying yes. to your app. Yes, Broccoli is proxying any, yeah, any oh, okay. JavaScript, or I'm sorry, any uh, JSON stuff, so that your browser is communicating only with the Broccoli server. And it even asks Broccoli server as if it were your backend server, and Broccoli server proxies that through. Oh, OK. OK, that's, that's what I was missing. That's what gotcha. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Has, has people compared or sure. Um, Joe Liss wrote up a comparison between all of the common ones. Oh, okay, cool. And I will uh, happily pull up any gulp. Uh, every time. <laughs> every time. One day Google will learn. Well, learn about me, that is, I guess. Yeah, not that broccoli will ever be more popular than broccoli. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this is what uh, she says, and again, this is um, just an introductory blog post that was written a while ago, but it says, Gulp tries to solve the problem of chaining plugins, but in my view, it gets the architecture wrong. Rather than passing around trees, it passes around sequences, event streams of files, uh, in streams of buffers. This works fine in the case of one input uh, file maps into another output file, but when a plugin needs to follow import statements and thus needs access to input files, to input files out of order, things get complicated. For now, uh, plugins follow import statements tend to just bypass the build tool and read directly from the file system. In the future, I hear that there will be uh, helper libraries to, to turn all that streams into a virtual file system and pass that to the compiler. So I have no idea because I've never used Grunt. Or I've never used Gulp. I'm sorry. I've also never used Grunt. But um, yeah. What's up? Yeah. Um, so what it does is it uses that. I, I call it source maps because that's what Chrome calls it, but I feel like that's not the proper term. But you can do the eval thing. Yeah. That also seems a little dirty. Um, you get used to it. Yeah. Is the best thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, yeah. It, I thought that at first too, um, because the old uh, homegrown build tools we had um, would do the same thing where they would output individual files as things in development mode, and it was kind of nice to flip through and see. But um, in this case, you're just you're looking at the um, JavaScript files here as if they would be in your app directory. Um, so like the tree structure or the file system is the same. Um, CoffeeScript slash this or you know JavaScript slash that. So y you get to you get used to that part. But yeah, there's no there's no way to do that. You could probably write a plugin to do that. Um, that would potentially be a plugin. But the figure printing plugin, right? It kind of has to do something similar where it looks at all your files and then it actually has to change your index file. Yeah. Oh, if you look at that, it would be a similar process. Yeah. Okay. So you could, yeah, potentially you could not concatenate them. And um, like I'm doing down apps.js, and you could write a plugin that would inject, take all those files recursively, and then inject those into your index.html. That wouldn't be that hard. Okay. But we use ES6. Um, and you kind of have to, it, the, the other thing with this is you kind of have to use some sort of dependency management within your JavaScript because you can't guarantee load order. Yeah. Um, so we use ES6 in our app. Um, and the ES6 transpiler requires that all files be available at, trans at transpile time uh, so that it can make optimizations. So 
we're in the situation where we couldn't do that. But if you were using like require, um, you could definitely do something like that. But again, you couldn't guarantee the order of files, so you would have to use something like that. Something like require or another AMD or any kind of um, package management or chain management system. What's up? Uh, so I was going to ask, I mean, the difference between Gulp and Broccoli, obviously that streams thing is a big, a big difference. And I'm just kind of wondering, do you have any sense in your build times, like, Number one, I guess, like how fast are your build times? Sure. And do you know like where the bottlenecks are? Because I know for stuff I've been doing, I believe it's like in the SaaS. Okay. Dollars where it spends most of the time. I'm just wondering yeah. if you think that. Absolutely. The, the streams thing and the fact that it's using the file system is a bottleneck or not? Yeah. There is a, there's an argument uh, that I could look up, uh, and maybe I should, or actually maybe I can just show you our um, production or our app. Um, but it, it will output the slowest trees, um, and it will give you the average build times. Um, and that's something, though all those things are available, but the, de the default server for Broccoli is so thin that it doesn't do all those things, so you really have to implement your own server to output those um, statistics. But yeah, it absolutely does. But this, we find the same thing, is that generally um, a lot of the work is involved in either moving files in between plugins on the file system or in something like SAS or something like JS Hint. Um, but let me show you that real quick. So when you get a bigger app, that was JSON running. Uh, when you get a bigger app, the first build always takes longer um, because it's building everything completely from scratch with no cache, and subsequent builds go a lot faster. I think my average build time without an SSD is about um, 800, meg 800 milliseconds to one second. Um, the other developers that have SSDs are about 200 milliseconds. Um, so really, there is a lot of I/O that is bottleneck. Um, but let me um, let me change a file in my project, which I happen to have over here. Um, Oops, not my way around my own project. So that case was one millisecond. Um, and you see it. Well, like one second. Or one second. Yeah, one millisecond, don't I wish? That'd be defining one. Um, so in this case, you see up here, um, one of the slow trees was JS hint um, because it JS hinted the whole thing. In this case, it only JS hinted. Um, a little bit, and that's still pretty long. Usually, JS hints only 40 milliseconds for changing one file. Um, and it also didn't compile SAS because no SAS files were changed. So and I know there was that original implementation that used hard links, right? And that was supposed to be faster. And yeah. And now we're just writing everything to the hard drive, which seems like I.O. is a problem. Sure. So the future is, I guess I saw their virtual file systems, like in memory, to, to make that process Um better. They do a lot of soft linking right now. Um, I can show you what the temp directory looks like when the server's running. That would be a good thing to show. Actually, let me show it over here. Um, you do broccoli serve. Oops. Great. Um, and so that's what the temp directory looks like. So each of those is an operation that's taking place. Um, by a plugin, whether or not that plugin is um, moving files around or merging files together. And inside there, there's a lot of optimizations to soft link. Um, so you can soft link the output of one plugin to the input of another plugin um, and things like that, as long as that plugin obviously should never modify the other one's output. But um, so there are some optimizations internally where they're doing to do that. But yeah, I don't know how you get too much faster with a, without worrying about I.O. Any other questions? How do you how do you deploy this thing? Do you guys just upload it to a CDN and then? No. Uh, well, um, we're an app engine, so app engine has CDN stuff for us. Um, so we use Ant to do our back end server build and then our front end server build, and then it just um, copies the assets that are built from Broccoli into the back end package, and then it deploys it, and then app engine does the CDN stuff for us. Already, could you call broccoli from Grunt just to do the build stuff? Absolutely. I think that that's, that's the eventual hope um, okay. for those two is that broccoli can be the um, asset pipeline aspect of it and Grunt can continue to be the task runner because I don't think that they ever plan to make it um, do those task runners. We use NPM a little bit um, 
in our app for like when I did npm start or npm clean, yeah. um, just to do our basic task running. But um, yeah, certainly Grunt could take that. Okay. Any more questions? All right, well, I'll throw this up on GitHub if anyone wants to uh, clone it and uh, play with it a little bit. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, ping me. Let me know. Be happy to help. Thanks. <laughs>